Uh, good evening. My name is Karen Planet. I'm president of AI Ohio this year. Today's program is the first of a, six, a series of six programs in AI Ohio's Design Awards series. Uh, before we start today's program, I would like to recognize and thank our featured sponsor, the Belden Brick Company. Belden's been a sponsor of AI Ohio for over 20 years, and it is through their long-term support of our chapter that we're able to bring innovative and quality programming to our members again this year. I'd also like to thank our annual sponsors, whose logos are shown on the screen now. A few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. Uh, we'll be hosting a Q&A session at the end, and we'll be looking to the chat box for your questions. We will also be placing a link in the chat box towards the end of the presentation. You can follow the link, enter your information, and your member number so that you'll be receiving learning units for today's program. Finally, I'd like to thank Robert Matchke for selecting the speakers and moderating the design series for AI Ohio this year. Robert is a past president of AI Ohio, the recipient of many awards, including the AI Ohio Gold Medal, the Cleveland Arts Prize for Design, the AI Ohio Gold Medal Firm, and national honors from the American Institute of Architects. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to turn the program now over to Robert to introduce our design speaker for this evening's program. Robert? Thank you, Karen. Barbara Bestor, FAIA, is the principal and founder of Bestor Architecture, a Los Angeles-based 24-person architectural design practice established in 1995. Raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, she received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University and a Master of Architecture degree from SciArc. A fellow of the American Institute of Architects and the recipient of many awards, including national honors from the American Institute of Architects, Barbara serves on the board of SciArc, the Los Angeles Conservancy, and the Silver Lake Conservatory of Music. Bestor has consistent, consistently pursued experimental architecture that engages the city through design, art, and urbanism. Her architectural form is explored through experiments in spatial arrangements, graphics, and color. Barbara's varied and progressive body of work connects with people on many levels, often outside the boundaries traditionally delineated for architecture, and believes that good design creates an engaged urban life and embraces the strange beauty that enhances everyday life experiences. Currently, Barbara is exploring urban design issues that directly affect Los Angeles and beyond with a modern sensibility that will create enduring impact. Please welcome Barbara Bestor, FAIA. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. I guess I'll, I'll share my screen, right, Kate? Okay. Okay, is that working? Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, those of you, all of you are in Ohio saying hello from um, Los Angeles. This image of LA I love because it sort of looks like it's all smog, but it's really actually just the morning, the morning dew. <laughs> but it's kind of a stereotype that people have about our, our city. Um, I think one thing I like to talk about is how LA has got these dual influences of, um, sunshine and smog like on the one hand you have the modernist kind of case study house idea of like sunlight and glass houses and people in nifty outfits and on the other hand you have sort of the smog thing of like punk rock and the LA school like the early Frank Gehry sort of fortress building stuff like that and that these the sort of sunshine and smog are the are the sort of two two currents maybe that run through some of LA's culture Oh, let me get this, let's see, sorry, there we go. This is, I just wanted to introduce you to my office where I'm actually sitting right now here in Silver Lake, um, Los Angeles. Silver Lake's this neighborhood um, that is, that I've lived in pretty much the whole time since I moved to California, uh, which was in the early 90s. And it's a neighborhood that is, it was sort of the home, it was the home of Lautner, 
of um, a lot of Schindler's projects. Neutra lived here as well, a lot of Neutra projects. So a lot of what we think of as the experimental modernism that is part of LA's architectural legacy is from here. And it's kind of a, a like a little hilly community on the east side of Los Angeles. And here's a, a, a statement. Are you, am I, is this gonna be blocked because of my share screen? Oops, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna move this. We can see it clearly. Okay, great. Yeah. So I love this. This is Mar Margaret Crawford, who's been at Berkeley for a long time, but she was at SciArc when I was there. And she sort of, she, she was often thinking about the the relationship between say Schindler and, you know, Tom Main and Morphosis or Frank Gehry. And this um, idea of the high and the low, I think is something that's, that for my generation is a big issue where, you know, we were, I personally was sort of trained, I guess, at the moment of neo-modernism on the heels of post-modernism. And I find that now we're in this, we're in a, it's a little bit of an open season, you know, in terms of what is, what is the discursive thing to do as an architect. And I think that um, there's a certain freedom to that. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit worrisome, but it's also very interesting to kind of sort out like what's actually, a, what's, what's the way that architecture should go in our given cultures. So a little, a little starting um, startup is maybe like 10 years out of school. I had just, I just, I'd moved to the East Coast. I moved back to LA. I was getting divorced. I had two kids. I was a single mom and I needed to find a house. And I like drove by this shack that was getting demolished or it was been, already been stripped down. I was like, I'll just buy that and I'll, I'll make it my home. And it was this weird impulse because I'd, I'd really been kind of trained and I'd been doing like fairly high modernist, flat roofed, you know, uh, Bauhausian buildings or something like that. And I kind of fell in love with this strange thing. And it reminded me also weirdly of the Unabomber cabin. This is the, this is it in the Richard Barnes photograph when it's in the FBI hangar, but that kind of Jungian classic idea of a house that is a kind of symbolic language. I suddenly got interested in that, which really hadn't been part of my previous training. And at first I thought I would clad it in mirror glass and do all these things showing the framing and different experiments like that. But what I ended up doing was this sort of very simple um, graphic kind of exercise in, in terms of reconstructing that house and using industrial windows. And it, it, um, I, because I had these girls, I'd suddenly started to get into color and pattern and trying out a bunch of different things that were sort of related maybe to my, to the seventies when I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but also seemed like a, um, a kind of family friendly, a way to, to incorporate like colors that the girls like, cause they were into pink. I'd always only liked black and navy being an architect, you know? And so it just, it was sort of this very freeing house also, especially the shape of it, like, at the time, it was really funny. Dwell was like, we can't publish this house because it has a gabled roof because around, this is 2000, 2001, that was definitely not okay um, in what was considered modern uh, contemporary architecture. And, but then it ended up getting into the New York Times. And then that, that ended up getting me a book deal and all kinds of other stuff happened. But you know, when I worked on this house, like one of the big things I was interested in, which I'm still interested in is sort of circulation as a way of, organizing space. And in this case, this idea that, go, that the garden in front of the house is sort of the same footprint as the house. And you can kind of circulate through the house, you know, in a cocktail party situation or kids on bicycles. And you can kind of, you never have to cross the path of somebody else you want to avoid because of the way that it's organized. Um, this is a book that deal that came out of that house. And, oh, I guess I don't have more pictures. Of it. So, so in this book, this is a this is a portrait of Schindler and his work that was one of the illustrations for the book. The book ended up being, it was called Bohemian Modern, Living in Silver Lake. And it looks at both the historic legacy of experimental modernism. I think you could even say suppressed modernism because it was, you know, Schindler buildings and Lautner buildings don't really fit the mold of a kind of Corbusian high modernist uh, case study language. And that I thought was sort of this place of inspiration where it's almost a sculptural enterprise. Definitely some of the stuff that influenced a younger Frank Gehry also. And so the book kind of used um, also like a, a new way of looking at the graphics, not so much the Swiss modern graphics, but a kind of collage, colorful 
um, design done by Michael Worthington. The illustrations were done by Jeff McFetridge. And I just kind of recorded some different architecture, some different cultural things in the neighborhood, kind of a portrait of a way of life. And after that, I, I started to get a bunch of sort of very heterogeneous um, commissions for different kinds of houses. And these are some of the houses that I've done over the last 20 years. Um, some of them are new, some of them are additions, but some of them are exploring, like the one in the upper left was just published in Dwell. That's a house in Venice um, Beach. And uh, we were keeping the perimeter of the original bungalow is sort of the lower wall. And then there's like an interior garden behind that. And then the actual new house is sort of inside that. But the whole house is actually extremely petite. I think it's maybe at the most 2000 square feet, um, but try not like have these different framing devices. Let's see here. Here are some more houses <laughs> over the years. Some in Malibu, some in Santa Barbara and just exploring different kinds of things, sometimes depending on the existing house, like the lower left one is a house in Malibu that is really, we did a surgical addition inside of a kind of compound of ranch houses that had actually been used as a summer camp. This is in the Point Doom neighborhood. So we sort of made this new piece, cut, cut out the one chunk and, and built this new part then kind of reorganized the remainder. Whereas the one on the upper left is a, is a kind of courtyard based house up in the mountains of Santa Barbara. Um, and then we also have been doing, you know, throughout the work on residential, um, I've been interested in really bringing like immersive atmospheric ideas to some interiors. So whether it's through paint or tile or vinyl, um, it's some of the work that it's some of the, the influence I've sort of started to get used to when I was doing so much commercial work. These are some commercial projects of mine where you don't have necessarily a big budget or a ton of time, but you really want to get a very specific atmosphere for your client. And in a way that actually makes sense sometimes for like given rooms within a house for a family. So this idea of the tools to toolkit that is not just materials, like sometimes it's just not possible to spend the money on like a beautiful wood, you know, ceiling and wall or, uh, you know, stone slabs, but but actually like using tile, using other kinds of um, color things can, can create a sort of immersive atmosphere. Um, I wanted to talk on kind of getting out of the residential thing, but looking at um, housing. This is a project that our office just did recently um, for a competition that the city of LA is holding called Low Rise. And, you know, you may not be aware of our homeless issues, but we have a big homeless issue in, in LA. And part of it's because we have a city that's more or less zoned for single family zoning, uh, single family residences. And it was actually down zoned in the eighties when there was a lot of empty space and empty apartments. And it's never been up zoned since, but now we have this huge crisis. So we have this kind of weird tension between single family context and nimbyism and trying to build housing. And so the city's looking for ways of doing housing that isn't just like leveling a block and building a mega structure. So they're exploring new kinds of um, re zoning and planning ideas. So one of them, what, what we are proposing is this idea of a four square, which is um, to take this is a this is an elevation of a street in a neighborhood called Frogtown, which is kind of working class neighborhood near my office here. And that these lots are very skinny and very long, which is typical in LA. And that in the back, you could maybe build a four four houses that are kind of in one as a way of densifying the neighborhood without like losing the streetscape and the the kind of rhythm of the neighborhood. Um, the idea, here's a kind of close up, like there's a house in the front that exists that becomes an ADU and then in the back becomes sort of four, four residences sort of under one roof or in one complex. So you could build it relatively cheaply using uh, type five construction, which is two by four construction around here. This is sort of a diagram of how that would work. And this, this something like this is proposed, you know, for these, these kind of neighborhoods that have relatively small houses that normally otherwise would get demolished and turn into like a big new structure, which is causing a lot of neighborhood anguish. These are the floor plans of the four units. And one of the fun things about it was also trying to make a sustainable solution. So, you know, we're in a desert climate here. So by, by sinking this 
rear yard structure down about four feet, we kind of create a, um, a thermal tunnel that's sort of pulling some of that hot air down, cooling it and up and kind of collecting um, through, the, through the staircases of the different units, a kind of vertical shaft of cooling. This is a model view of how these pieces fit together. And here's nice rendering of that kind of, let's say village life <laughs> continuing. And there's an interior view. Um, along those lines, we, we actually had already done a project that also used a, an unconventional zoning type here called um, single, uh, sorry, the small lot ordinance. And it was an ordinance that was created also to densify neighborhoods. And so we took five lots that were zoned multifamily, but just had just had little single family houses on them and turned that into 18 houses. And I was interested in this idea of um, stealth density. So typically the small lot ordinance has been producing stuff like on the left where you get kind of a row with uh, parking on the ground floor and a two story unit of housing above it. These are counted as uh, individual single family houses. So you can get a traditional mortgage on them, which is you know a big plus here as opposed to condos. Um, but you get this very tiny little footprint for your project. So in our in our site, this idea of stealth density was that um, that given the larger density of the neighborhood, it would make sense to kind of combine some of these units to sort of look like a house, even though it might be two houses or in some cases, three houses that are kind of lumped. They're kind of combined together and are literally in hiding in terms of the amount of density that they have. And also it allowed us to, to kind of work with this very complicated topographical site and sort of embed this, the houses um, so that views and, and privacy were maintained. They're also all organized around a parking court where the parking is external instead of internal. So we, we lose the massing of those big garages in California's climate. That's like not a big deal to have exterior parking. And then that, that communal sort of parking area became essentially a courtyard for the neighborhood and everybody's kitchen faces and everybody sort of enters there. And, and so there's a sort of a public life within this community of 18 houses. This is sort of showing that massing of the area and the resulting buildings. There's also obviously a graphic strategy where we were trying to make it more heterogeneous. So using the two colors, like the black uh, fiber cement board houses and then the, the standing seam white metal ones, kind of a view of village life again. Kind of, this is showing, th these are literally a uh, property line between these units, even though they're sort of connected. There's a little bit of a gap between each structure. The also the the unusual roof structures allowed us to create really like tall volumes that that make a sort of much greater spaciousness on relatively small floor plates. And we also use these big industrial windows um, that keep the light in. Oh, sorry, went a little fast there. It, they're, they're, they're between two streets also. So some of that buildings have kind of a view on the back. And I think <laughs> a lot of these pictures. So this is that interior courtyard before, actually now it's much more grown in. Their landscaping was done by landscape design. It was Mia Lehrer, landscape architect. Oh my gosh, let me see. This is my favorite slide because this is when the neighborhood, they were, have, have actually really kind of become a community. So they sometimes have these big communal dinners in the parking lot, which, you know, for me, it was just my dream. And I got invited to one of these dinners and I wish I'd brought like a real photographer with me because it's so great that that happened or happens. So there's a view from the street side. And then that that brings me to a different um, idea, which is this, the, so in the land of this housing concepts, I was also looking at like larger, like more ambitious housing for LA and again where I'm living I'm living in a town there where there's people are thinking about new things but there really hasn't been a lot of movement from the planning and zoning side so I've been looking for a long time at this big tract of land the, the one in the foreground there's this LA river and then there's a thing that looks sort of like it's been torn apart that's going to that's the site of a huge park called G2 park which is a state funded park that's going to get built but right behind it is a strip of these warehouses which were built relatively recently this whole area was a big railroad site and 
those lots were sold off um, privately, unfortunately, then they're also zoned manufacturing. So my, my idea or our studio did a project for this last summer where we were looking at like, well, what if you rezoned the manufacturing zones in LA, which really aren't getting used for manufacturing that much. A lot of times they've been converted to, um, to creative office, which is, which is not like the best use really. It's very low density type of use. It's not really providing like manufacturing jobs, et cetera. So what if we, what if we rezoned and let the commercial uses kind of be verticalized, which is like the buildings on the left here, like that could be like a commercial compound with as much square footage, frankly, as is in all those flat pancake warehouses, and then create a new district for relatively dense housing um, that's also adjacent to this amazing public park. So that's, this is the San Fernando Road project. That's kind of what this is about. Here's the idea we we're, again, we we're looking at making new city blocks with some, um, interior landscape space that becomes part of that 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 particular neighborhood's block if each block is a neighborhood as it were and we were we'd sort of replaced the supermarket that's in that area in there and this shows kind of a an imagined variety of building types that could go in this allowing um allowing like a, a you know could be multiple architects etc this is kind of more like an outline but allowing this form of density that is maybe a contrast to what's actually right now the only kind of thing that works in LA financially, which is to build two or three layers of parking and then housing above it. And it ends up sort of killing the pedestrian streets and it ends up, you know, not really having any outdoor space that's qualitative. So sort of a new typology. Um, we also were proposing like an building an embankment or a berm that allows bridges to go over. There's a major railroad line that's going through here. So you kind of bridge over the railway and connect to all those big public parks and also across the river, which is a, a huge bike lane um, and commuter bicycle path. So trying to tie the city together maybe through an urban intervention. Some more of that. And here's some more views of what this might be like on the inside. So speculative housing solutions. Um, on another, in terms of projects that are actually built a bit, so sometimes we're doing adaptive reuse. And this is a this is a project in this neighborhood, Silver Lake Conservatory of Music, which is a, um, a music school started by Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And it's um, a school that sort of 50% classes are free for kids who don't have money and the other 50% are paid and LA, LA school systems had a lot of cuts in the arts department. So really music programs have more or less been cut out of public public uh, schools and the band, the Chili Peppers all are graduates of public programs where they did have music education. So there's a kind of commitment to trying to replace and augment what's available for kids. But as a designer, the idea was to take this, like re recreate a storefront situation. This was, this is all new, and but we're, we were using this, the school was originally in like a little tiny storefront. So we sort of took their old storefront and re, re, relocated in, into this new building. Um, but mostly what we were doing was building these, this, these little music classrooms, taking a bowstring truss warehouse and creating kind of a school for kids and also performance space. And this is sort of the beautiful, typical LA uh, warehouse type of space, the Bowstring Trust building. And so within that, we've created these sort of corridors, kind of Dr. Caligari-esque corridors that each of those doors is one of the music classrooms. And on the left is this sort of super graphic covered um, mute volume. And that's actually the bathroom volume. Uh, by code, we had to have a rather huge amount of bathrooms because of our performance space. And rather than sort of cram them at the edges and squish the program, I decided to sort of turn it into like a light reflecting piece in the middle that creates this corridor. So it, 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 it yeah, so it kind of brings light from the skylights into that zone. These are some of the classrooms. Each teacher has their own classroom. They are in effect. And this is the kind of corridor past that bathroom volume. And in the performance space, there's a very simple kind of approach. There's actually a big mirror that's reflecting the ceiling to create that 
some of that openness because we had to have a lot of shear walls in here for our earthquakes. And this is the opening night with some of the Chili Peppers people, our class, our students. And in another, another attack on a warehouse, I guess, this is a, a project in Culver City, which is the big home of uh, creative offices. And this is a building for Beats by Dre, which is now Apple Music, but it's a, it a, a speaker company. I'm sure you've heard of that was sort of a combination. It's a, a marriage, as it were, of the music business and the tech business. And the warehouse that we that they chose as a home had very had two stories, but very low ceilings and a crazy bunch of columns that were a little bit random. But the whole site, actually all of Culver City is really built on silt. And to remove a lot of columns would mean building, you know, 80 to 100 foot caissons everywhere. So we kind of decided to leave the columns, but still do these big cuts and create these large skylights to bring light in. So this this space is the the sort of main drag between the lobby and the employee parking lot. And we did a kind of grand museum quality stair and there's a cafe at the end on the left. So this is really the, the sort of main social street kind of connector for everybody. Here's that coffee shop. So everybody coming in from parking their car walks by this, or if you're coming in as a guest from the lobby. And then that corridor also, that's in the middle. And then there's two big atrium spaces. And one of them, this one is the, 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 the side of the building that was dedicated to the people in operations who are running, uh, let's say they're tracking shipping containers at all hours of the day and things in different time zones. And they, they requested a more contemplative kind of calm space to have alternate work surfaces in. So this is kind of like a, a, uh, like a reading room type of a space for that group. Um, in between the two atrium are, are these different corridors and kind of nooks that allow um, both allow the columns to remain, frankly, and then kind of we carved out spaces opportunistically to, to get these little moments that have become very popular Instagram <laughs> locations. Um, but the other atrium is it was uh, owned by the marketing department who really wanted more of a kind of art school whiteboard open rooms um, type of space. So that's got the, you know, it's got the same skylight situation, but a different atmosphere, largely through the use of paint and some surface treatments. And there's also a secondary stair parallel to the big grand stair that's kind of like a quick shortcut for employees who don't really want to go down. Let's say the more introverted employees don't actually want to go down the grand stair all the time. And we created a, a vocabulary of graphic treatments that are part of our wayfinding. So they're the four quadrants of the building are color coded. And there's also you know, patterns ranging from sort of our interpretation of plywood to more graphic patterns that kind of subtly hint at where, where you might be in the building. So like this is the executive wing and we sort of tongue in cheek made it with gold and silver plywood patterns and wood paneling. This is one of the executive offices. And we also, we commissioned a series of photos from Iwan Bon of less, less traditional sites in Los Angeles, including the sites, the homes of all the founders like um, Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. And those, were, those became part of the thing that kind of grounded the building in its California, LA location as opposed to Silicon Valley. Another one that we, another similar project or related project is uh, a series of offices that we did for Snapchat. Snapchat is also a California building uh, company and they had relocated, they had sort of somewhat famously been stretched out in a many, many storefronts and little buildings all over Venice Beach. And as they grew, they decided they needed like a bigger space that would allow, you know, the kind of more interaction between parts of the company. So they took um, six leases in, on, on buildings in an, in an office park in Santa Monica. So we went through and kind of remodeled each of them. But this is this is one of the first ones that we did. And it was an interesting building where it was uh, characterized by these two large spaces that had at one point been a museum and didn't really have a lot of, didn't have a lot of natural light. And my goal here was to really bring nature kind of 
back into the building. So creating this wallpaper pattern with the leaves and wood surfaces, natural wood, some vinyl wood, the palette of green as well as the yellow snap kind of throughout it. So there's a certain earthiness. The idea of it was the an atrium, I mean, a Athenaeum. And, and then also these really big floor plates. So we started to make these wood structures that would kind of act as informal offices and kind of break up those massive structures, uh, massive spaces. This is like an example of the design of one of those pieces. And here's kind of like a view of how that office feels. And in a completely different space, um, done a lot of work in both historic preservation and curating. And um, one joy has been working on a couple of Lautner houses over the last, well, recent years. And this is sort of the, the bell of the ball. This is a house called Silvertop that is something that Lautner designed in the late 50s and it was under construction from like say 1960 to 65 or 66. Um, but then it was abandoned and, and it was a shell but had never really been completed until the early 70s. Um, a neighborhood couple bought it out of bankruptcy and then kind of just finished it up and lived there until I guess 20, 14 or something. So, so it was sort of perfectly preserved in a way, but also needed a lot of work. And this is it sort of after our work, but this is some, these are some great photos about the construction of <laughs> this building. Um, the geometry, you know, uh, Lautner was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin and believed deeply in the idea of organic architecture. The, you know, the, the, in this drawing, this is sort of like a presentation drawing, but the, the big curving um, thicker walls are these brick walls that do not reach the ceiling. And then there's the four dots are the four columns that carry the concrete structural shell roof. And that roof is really, it's related to Nervi, it's related to the freeway construction that was kind of going on. It's really almost like an infrastructural project, the building of that roof. Here it is in its beautiful, like recent state. Um, I'll show you some construction pictures in a minute, but this is, this is the floor plan in more And these are the parts of the floor plan that had never been finished in the original, um, house like that were that were never completed after 1965. So those are the parts where we had some freedom as architects kind of talking to the house to to build, to rebuild those um, as interiors, not as exteriors. These are some of the construction photos of the original house. So that that concrete truss is kind of spanning across the building. And those exposed columns remain um, exposed throughout the house. There's a real, there's a real discussion between raw and the cooked throughout this Lautner project. Here's what it looks like now. Um, and this is, this is one of the rooms that we were able to work on ourselves. So this is the kitchen. And we, in the, in the background, you see this horizontal wood that's this uh, Monterey Cypress. The whole house has no, no plaster, well, yeah, almost no plaster, no drywall. It's all either brick, wood, cork, um, or concrete. And what we wanted to do is maintain that warmth of the wood, but not do anything new that might mistake a future historian for, you know, what was original, what was not. So all of our pieces have the same Monterey Cypress, but running vertically in those thin strips that you see. And then we also, like most of the built-ins in the house are done more of a rigid um, geometry. And we kind of, our, our pieces are curving and sort of more fluid. So they're related to the house, but they're also reading a little bit differently. This, for example, is like what the house was like when we got it and the exterior kind of cut off completely. And this is what we did. Like we, we sort of kept opening things up that had been sort of filled in in the 70s. We added a couple more glass opening pieces also to kind of improve the circulation around the house. Oh, gosh, sorry. Ah, <laughs> sorry. Oh, so, um, this, like this bedroom, for instance, you know, is now it, it always had these sort of a separation of the glass windows are on their own pivot. And then the shutters are on a, are 
three feet away and on a separate pivoting system. They were both manual before. Those are now automated. There's this automated um, skylight system above it. Um, and we hit, we replaced all the cork. We had to source it from its original source in Spain and then inset lighting and sound into some of the, the grid of this cork. And this piece is actually a bathroom that we got to do. This was also hadn't been finished. So we kind of wanted to do a, what would Lautner do now? Kind of what's the 21st century version of a, of a, of a house of the future. And so in this project, there's a glass wall behind that, um, behind that tub. And the glass wall is an entire panel that now recedes into the floor at the touch of a button. And there's also a glass skylight that's frameless um, that also recedes at the touch of it. So basically the whole shower becomes an outdoor shower if you press the button and open everything up. And that's is one of those things that Lautner had maybe a hundred drawings about how to make this an indoor outdoor space in his in his archive at the Getty and, and the drawings about this particular house. So we were um, thrilled to kind of explore that in a way that you couldn't have done in the 60s or the 70s. Here's the living room, beautiful furniture designed by uh, Jamie Bush, also an architect and interiors person. Some of our inserts are like the shelves that are hanging on the wall. More automated pieces. How's it? Here's a little video of, let's see if this works. It's just sort of like all the automated moving parts of the house. It's, uh, these are, some of those are original, some of those are us. But there was a real idea about technology and the future in the in the, the begin from the beginning of the planning of this house. Uh, we also took that into things like these the interface, a kind of a analog interface for a very digital back um, control system. And these illustrations were done by Jeff McFetters, and then they were etched in, and they're kind of a replacement for the plastic kind of lit up. Uh, dashboard that had been in the house originally that we weren't able to, we couldn't find anyone who could make those again. So we kind of made a 21st century version. Here's the hieroglyphics of controls. And also there's this piece up there, this glass um, crow's nest that was originally drawn by Lautner to be like a heavy concrete piece. It was never built. The column that supports it was built. So we um, decided to kind of realize it, but build it in a way that, again, you couldn't have done originally. So using the large format curved glass to create this little uh, viewing platform, you get this amazing 360 view. Let's see, how am I doing for time? So this, here's a, this is another house. This is a, let's say this is the low, super low budget silver top type of house. This is a house that we just finished in Silver Lake. And it's, um, it's next to this amazing house on the left here. Um, this is a view from that house, which is the, uh, oh my gosh, it's a house by uh, Rafael Soriano. And that house is this really interesting shape. You know, it's a, it's a real prow of a ship. It's kind of an, it's almost an art deco house. This the Lippitz house, 1932. So early Soriano, Soriano, as you know, was one of the case study architects later on. But, but um, at this time, um, it, it was an extruded curved shape, almost a kind of Corbusian European import. And the idea of shape as the way to generate a kind of a house design is what we were interested in looking at. Um, we also, our client actually owned this house and originally we were commissioned to do something sort of hidden on the back, but then they bought the land next to them. But our goal was to make it so that our, our new house wouldn't interfere with the view of that house at all because it has a sort of amazing boat-like, you know, uh, 180 view. So we kind of ducked down and really built a house that kind of cl climbs down the hill. Uh, we also were using these um, trusses to do that, which is something that I've been doing a lot lately where the, the by using a, a, a truss system, we end up getting a bunch of space to run what we need to run through the house systems. Um, but also it's kind of an interesting, very fast way of getting this part built, the roof structure. There's a floor plan. Here's kind of the shapes of the Soriano on the right, and then our house, which is basically the idea of extrusion, but running um, 
running uh, vertical, well, horizontally, I guess extruded vertically, like basically we're taking the shape of the hill and extruding it back, similar to how the Lippitz house is the shape of a boat extruding vertically. Here's the family at play. And this whole house sort of opens up in the front and is sort of transparent through. There's an amazing view on the back and then the view on the on this front side is of the reservoir. So you can see these windows are pocketing. And on the interior, this is that that kind of hill shape kind of climbing down the coming down the hill and there's stairs that go down to the bedroom wing on the lower level. Um, there's a bat, uh, this kitchen is sort of has, a, has this big curtain to kind of uh, mask it off if, if they're doing like they, these guys sometimes have fundraisers and things and there's a, a loft bed that was requested by the offspring. There's a view from the master bedroom. The owner looking out and this using mirrors to kind of reflect back and, and sort of dematerialize some of the corners. And this is the back of that house, sort of the view of the city behind it. Last project, quickly, I'll show you is this. Um, this is a, a winery in Napa Valley. And um, our client is actually the son of another winery owner and wanted to do a kind of rethink of what wineries language should be or could be and really create a wine that was for a younger audience maybe. And I, I think if you guys have ever been to Napa, you know, there's so much of a theme going on um, amongst wineries of sort of neo-Italian or neo-French or it's a Loire Valley Chateau or whatever. And and what um, our client Kashi Kaledi was interested in was, was saying like, well, you know, the California wine business really is a post-war industry. Like it really started after World War II in California. And maybe, maybe you know, you could explore that language, you know, for the mid-century, or maybe we came up with that together. But, but basically I was thinking about um, Palm Springs and these sort of recognizable, almost like uh, billboard-like, languages that are recognizably kind of Southern California of a certain moment and thinking about how that might inform something. This is actually a very low budget project by all standards, but this is the site. It's it's set back from the street. So this is this is the before, but our, our whole structure is in this area. And in a way the building does have to be kind of a roadside attraction for itself because it's because of it's how it's set back. So we always thought of the of the tasting room as being a little bit of a billboard. And the strategy was to build essentially a very, very big uh, sort of mid-century living room and then have a separate structure that is a shade structure that sort of extends out and creates shaded and light areas outside of it, but that itself could read as a, as a, as a sort of billboard for the winery. Um, so this is the, the tasting room is a separate structure. There's a big landscape. And then the actual production building is more of a typical um, industrial facility where we just sort of tailored the front part of it to, to create a second tasting room and some outdoor space. But, but otherwise that's a very inexpensive um, industrial uh, metal building. So here's a floor plant, floor, floor view. Um, this is that production building. So that upper floor, these, I, we were working on an exhibit about Albert Frey and Lena Bobardi at the time. So I was really looking at a lot of Albert Frey buildings. So these are a lot of these are really just exaggerated shapes from, from kind of Palm Springs ideas. The interior of the crush pad, the open air space, barrel storage. This is that overhang of the production building that doubles as another outdoor um, tasting space for events. And then the main, um, the main uh, tasting room itself, which is sort of adjacent to the parking, the language here was also on the interior to use that Herman Miller kind of mid-century language very overtly. Uh, it's been incredibly popular. It was able to stay open a lot of time during COVID because it's, you know, it's all more or less open air. And you can see how the shade structure kind of works as it's um, sort of a beacon. 
And I believe this is my last slide. This is from a view from the landscape looking out. Is that it? Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Well, Barbara, your, your work is very beautiful and I, I appreciate you taking the time to share with AI Ohio and our fellow architects. I'm, I'm quite jealous that uh, you get to design in all these nice locations where you don't have to worry about closing the windows year round. <laughs> well, we have tight so. energy codes though. So we, if, you, if you are gonna close your windows, then you have to be very efficient, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's very beautiful work. Um, we do have a series of questions, and um, if you have some time, we'd like to ask some of our members. Uh, I do call your name uh, based on what you wrote in the chat. Kate is going to unmute you so you can ask it live. Um, just be respectful of everybody's time. So I'd like to start off with uh, Jack Bialowski. Hi, Barbara. Um Fantastic work, uh, so nice to see it. Thank you for sharing it. I have uh, a couple of questions for you. One uh, relates to the first work um, relating to the four square housing and the projects for densification in Los Angeles. We face similar issues in Cleveland, much less imaginatively at present. And uh, we're struggling with uh, our zoning and wondered how you're dealing with that. Is LA using form-based overlays? How, how are you managing? Well, we, you know, not a lot yet. I think, I think we have the mayor's office has a design bureau that the former architecture critic for the LA Times here, Christopher Hawthorne, is sort of the head of design for the mayor. Um, so they, they're the ones who actually organized that competition for low rise. And there was, there was some people in the planning department who like came up with that small lot ordinance, which did result in some interesting um, possibilities. But right now, a lot of the chatter is about ADUs and that you know, any single family dwelling can add an ADU up to 1200 square feet, which is often around the size of original houses in LA anyhow. So, that that I think I think the permits went up from, you know, a thousand a year or two ago to like eight thousand ADU permits getting pulled this recent years, but the bigger issue I think of um, how to get larger scale density hasn't really been addressed. There's a there's a large there's a new update of the northeast plan, which is this area that I'm in. That's it's going to rezone a bunch of a bunch of the bigger streets to have much higher density possibilities. So we're hoping that um, that, that will kind of loosen things up. But I, but I feel like the there's so much political stuff behind this, sure. but you know, there's, there's that sense that single family residential zoning itself is kind of uh, Racist. Basically. Yes. Well, that it's it, is any of it workforce housing. I noticed that even in your second project, when all those families were out in the courtyard, it's it's all pretty white, and it, they seem pretty well, that's affluent. My staff. <laughs> wasn't, 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 no one had moved in at that time. That well, that ended up. You know, we I, we thought those were going to be selling for like four or five hundred, but by the time they were built, they sold for close to a million because people liked them. So that's you know that they were still market rate. The, the affordable housing, you know, the, through tax codes, there's a bunch of really, I mean, like Brooke Scarpa, um, Kevin Daly, like a lot of people are building really interesting stuff. A lot of it's in Santa Monica, which I think as a city has got more incentives to do like not so giant, but really creative ways of building housing. Um, city of LA still doesn't have as much of that because it's kind of either, you know, a 400 unit building on a block with some affordable in it or affordable sure. housing is often like 50 units but you know then you're you're kind of waiting for those tax credits for four years and you know it's a it's a struggle to get stuff built so i think everyone's hoping to streamline the process so that affordable housing can get built relatively quickly and much more cheaply but we, it, we, we, we have saw, not solved it at all <laughs> we saw some of larry scarpa's work and talked to larry about it. it's really quite imaginative my, my second and i'll get out of your way unrelated question uh what a uh, an honor to work on uh, lautner 
projects and what a fantastic job you did. I'm uh, curious to know about the nature of the drawings that you had to work with and how, how did he manage to create all of these organic forms, you know, at Bob Hope's house, other places, you know, how did they do the math? How were they able to draw it, you know, pre-computer? <laughs> Well, there, you know, all the drawings are in the um, Getty archive. And so we, we were able to go and um, we just, we photographed every single drawing around that house. Um, I mean, that exists of the house, which was probably like 400 drawings or something. It, that, that particular one um, was, you know, the client was, was, like actually was getting, you know, writing tax deductions for doing kind of research on the whole house as product development site. And so like they were both like the inventor sort of client and the inventive architect had a very good marriage in a way and, and did all kinds of stuff over the 10 years, I guess, of developing that project. But if you're talking about, yeah, all the, the, the bigger picture, I mean, you know, you have to think about at the time you had Nervi building stuff, you had, um, Saarinen's um, chapel at MIT is is like sure. about 10, five or 10 years before this. Mm -hmm. So there was actually, I mean, concrete shell was like the hot new thing. And the geometry of it isn't, it's not like that complicated, you know, it's not, um, it's not, it's not impossible. But, but there's also, there was also some great engineers um, working with him. Like there, uh, I can't remember the guy that he wasn't on Silvertop, but after that, he was the architect, the engineer for all of Lautner's work, but um, it's that thinking out of the box from the engineering end that's obviously so important. So we, I mean, whenever we get a chance to do something interesting, we're like, let's get the most creative engineer on this too, so that we can kind of go like, are we doing this, you know, CLT or like what's, what's out there that we could try something new with or get a new kind of way of making space. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, Terry Welker had a, a, two questions, but Terry, um, you had a question about climate change and its effect in LA. Would you like to add to that? Uh, well, yes. <clears throat> I mean, uh, given the uh, what we're seeing in terms of climate action, uh, I'm just curious as to what's going on in uh, your neck of the woods with regard to the effect of uh, the dehydration of the West uh, and uh, the climate a change that's a, which we're trying desperately to uh, fix. But uh, meanwhile, uh, we have to deal with what's hand. I'm just curious what's going on there. Well, that's interesting. I mean, there's, there's, yeah, the, the kind of um, aridity of California and the water supply is a, is a bigger, you know, bigger picture issue um, politically and uh, in And what's its effect on architecture? Well, so so we have we probably have the most progressive green codes like mandatory for anything that gets built now around energy efficiency. But one of the big things that they did in the city uh, maybe five years ago is that we finally basically all water now coming off of any roof of any new structure or large addition has to be collected on site, and we have a whole. Um, requirement now for porosity and kind of decreasing the amount of paved surfaces and asphalt surfaces. We have major credits for cool roof um, systems like that, that, that new house that I did that goes down the hill, that's actually like a TPO white yeah. vinyl roof, like what you put on a Home Depot, um, right. which was very efficient from a reflectivity point of view, but, but um, solar is, now is it required? I guess it's you have to you have to set up for solar, and I think most big new projects have to have a solar requirement as well. But really, the, the the big one that I see from the point of view of the arid part is this water retention, because before everything had to be tight lined to the sewer, which went to the LA River, which went to the ocean, and now everybody realized, oh, we're drying out like everything's paved. We gotta we're drying out all the the aquifer, so the that's that's starting to change. Um, and you know, the, I think they're going to go to mandatory all electrical appliances now and kitchens and stuff like that. That's about to happen. It's kind of um, it's not completely required yet, but that looks like the next step in the Title Twenty Four codes that we're working with. Um, well, it seems like every uh, region of the country has their own. I mean, we're all dealing with it in different ways because we have different problems. And uh, here in Ohio. Uh, which I consider the new Florida, 
um, the vacation <laughs> spot of the future. Um, I think that uh, we're going to learn. Lakefront we, we, real estate, yeah. Well, we actually still have uh, uh, Four Seasons and a really beautiful lake. I like your glasses, Terry. Oh, thanks. Oh, I don't know if you can see me or not. So it's like I can see the ones in your in your profile picture. Oh, so, oh gotcha. Thank, thanks, Terry. I appreciate the question. Um, Michael DeMarco had a question regarding uh, the concept of stealth density. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, Barbara, great presentation. I really loved your projects. You, you can really sense the dynamism and the color and the vibrancy in, in what you make. Um, and, and I made a comment in the, in the chat here that Silver Lake, your community is lucky to have you as a resident and an employer. Um, so during your uh, Blackbirds project presentation, you made a comment about stealth density and you sort of, I think kind of hinted on it in the following project, but what might be some strategies um, that you could apply to something larger like a mixed use development that mixes commercial and residential at, at a little bit larger of a scale? Well, I guess, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's we're kind of getting back into the um, territory of like, you know, what, what, what can we do as architects in terms of giving forms and shapes to things? And I'm, I'm like pro shape kind of person. So, so um, I feel like that's, you know, it's, it's contrary to say some of the rules of high modernism, you know, where you're, where you're going more for a, whatever uh, boxes and stuff. But, but I think that what what you can do, and you you see it around the world in different projects. And I, I mean, I, I do think like this this moment as an architect is a weird moment because we're very much in the present, but there isn't necessarily like a rule as to what's hot and what's not. Like you know, you look at even architectural record, like things are very different from each other. Um, but I think it's interesting um, on the layer, especially on larger scale projects that are kind of urbanist and like trying to trying to make a sense of place for the people who live in a given city or a given neighborhood is to, is to kind of embrace the idea of forms and also especially outdoor spaces and really shaping those that, that um, are legible and whatever the kind of language that might work for that um, could be. But, but to me, it's kind of taking the, the idea of putting a couple of things together that may not normally have gone together, you know, like you'd either express them all differently or you'd make this one big box container that you sort of can shape, you can, you can sort of push heterogeneous things together and kind of put them into one, one envelope that changes the nature of both programs and also of the larger context of your project. So I guess I it's kind of in the sculpture department maybe, but it does seem to, I think it does work kind of urbanistically and it's maybe not unrelated to like collage city ideas or something like that, you know, like more um, older, 70s and 80s kind of concepts that were out there. That's great, thank you. Barbara, we have uh, one more question uh, from Mike Mock. There we go. Uh, hi, Barbara. Thank you uh, for your presentation. And uh, your spaces look like really fun to be in and uh, 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 look, look like they were then fun to do as well. I did have a question about, um, you know, you mentioned you moved from Cambridge to Los Angeles. And so I was curious as to how that, you know, with the your designs maybe in Cambridge with the freezing weather conditions and all that stuff implies. Uh, when you when you moved to Los Angeles with these different weather conditions, did, did your, um, your thought process about architecture change uh, as far as your, your um, your, your building design or, you know, could you go back and take what you're doing now and take it to Cambridge and, and think it would be just as successful? That's interesting. Well, I mean, to be honest, you know, I moved to LA when I was 21 so, to go to grad school. So a lot of my architecture education was here, but I guess a lot of my sense memory of architecture was from Cambridge. And, um, but really the reason that I went out there or out here, um, was that when I was in college, I, I took a year and went to the AA in London. And it was when Alvin Boyarsky was teaching there. And it was kind of like, you know, Ram Koolhaas was giving a seminar and Zaha had a show in the little school gallery. And so that was a very interesting time because no one, this is in the 
mid to late eighties and no one was building anything much, you know, I think Foster was probably building something, but a lot of people were just working on ideas. And at the, I really loved it. I couldn't really afford to go there for school, but they were like, don't go to the East coast, go to the West coast. If you're going to go to architecture school, because everybody's going to build more stuff. But, you know, that's where everybody seems to be building stuff. And this is again, this, you know, early Gary kind of coming out and Morphosis. And I ended up getting an internship at Morphosis that summer afterwards in LA. And, and kind of was like, this is great. Like, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff here that you can't do. And I did feel, I would say I felt a little oppressed in Cambridge when I was in college that um, it seemed like almost every new building that got built had to be covered in brick or fake brick. And I just felt like that was sort of, that made me sad. I didn't, I didn't want that to happen. So, I mean, I loved like, I worked, I think I interned at Cambridge seven when I was in high school and they had done that really cool aquarium in Boston. And there, you know, there's a lot of brutalism in Boston, but that was sort of on the wane when I was, um, by the time I was in college. So it seemed like the, the land of uh, the land of you know plenty coming to the west coast and and it did it did turn out to be also in my case a place where you could sort of make your way by starting out maybe doing a lot of you know I did a lot of like home offices with custom furniture and kitchens and stuff when I started and I kind of was able to build up a practice which is you know that's that's a whole nother um so I th actually I, well it's not, like like, like a, when I was in, I was in Nashville recently and a lot of people, there's all these different cool practices in Tennessee and it's like, you get to know a group of people and you get a couple of projects and you get a couple more projects and in a place like LA, because it's so, um, it's such distinct, like big neighborhoods, but there's a lot, like once you start, you can kind of get more clients and, and start to kind of expand over, over, you know, let's say in my case, 30 years or whatever, but it's, it, it's been a good place to be. So the, the, what they were saying in England, I think was right for me anyhow, at the time. Thank you. Well, Barbara, Steve Kordowski, who's on this, on this, he always says if he's ever had to start a practice again, he would start it with a city that has a Ferrari dealership. <laughs> so LA is probably a good spot. I don't, I think we have more Lamborghini <laughs> dealerships than Ferraris, but yeah, I think I hear what you're saying. And that is that, I mean, that, yeah, I have a lot of celebrity clients now and it's kind of a whole thing. Like, oh my gosh. Well, we appreciate your time and sharing your work. It was, it was a great way to start off our lecture series and we wish you well. And hopefully, you know, we can invite you to Ohio in person someday and, and join us at one of our conferences. But thank you. Thank you again for your time. Thank you um, so I just, much. Like, please, to, thanks for the questions too. That was great. Yeah, I just want to let everybody know that our next speaker is Thursday, April 29th. It's Lori Hawkinson, who's a principal with Smith Miller Hawkinson out of New York, New York, and uh, her work is equally as compelling as Barbara. So, uh, if you haven't signed up, please do. And then also in the chat is the link for learning units. So if you click on that and fill that out, um, AIA Ohio will process those as well. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm just leaving it open to give every, anybody else a chance to grab that link. Thanks, Kate. I'll see you later. Okay. I got you, Jen. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see the number. <laughs> okay.
This te the 10 left might have hit the link and left their Zoom so webinar open. <laughs> they're filling in the yeah, form. 